here tonight on the Blizzard of 78, as you see behind us, there has never been anyone like it. Um, I was a senior in high school that year. Uh, I thought prior to doing this research, and some, I shared this with some people as we were setting up, I really thought I knew just about everything about it. it because I, it was so much of it was so vivid, and it was going through uh, something like 1,100 pieces of material. Photographs, newspaper, magazines, video, um, individual interviews. It was about 1,100 things that I worked with and found out I didn't know very much at all. And I couldn't because you couldn't go anywhere. You were cut off. You were locked in your own neighborhood. So whatever you thought you knew was in a, you know, poured through a very narrow filter. And we were fortunate, more than fortunate, that our next door neighbor, Paul Scott, was the town engineer and he was allowed to go everywhere. And Paul shared with me uh, something like 800 pictures that very few people had ever seen before. And then we were fortunate as well that late, late, late in the process, in fact, the Tuesday before I spoke in February, um, another set of photographs that was taken by a police officer named Robert Rosemere emerged that people hadn't seen before. So those, some of those have been added into the mix as well. So we'll get underway and we'll take you through the blizzard, which I'm certain many of you remember. I'm going to do this instead of being landlocked. There we go. So we're going to set the stage. Um, stuff you probably forgot and maybe never know I wanted to know. Uh, Al Capsula Labner was to be retired after many years of being in the funny papers. Uh, the biggest movie in December of 77 into January was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I watched the trailer for it today. Gets your attention still. Um, space shuttle program was underway. Tip O'Neill was the speaker. President Carter was in office, and the number one show in the nation was Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> the Celtics were cursed with Sidney Wicks and Curtis Rowe. Um, Larry Bird would join the team later that year. I went to Boston College in the fall of 78, and I can walk, remember vividly walking across the quad there and being handed a flyer to get season tickets for the Celtics. Season tickets for the Celtics. Anybody want to venture a guess what a season ticket cost in 1978? $29. $29. <laughs> right? This Cadillac cost $14,700. And gas was 65 cents. <laughs> Governor Dukakis was in place. He will lose a primary later that year to... Governor King. Uh, bleacher ticket was $3 to see the Red Sox. And I did as well watch, uh, I watched the clip. I was there. I had a ticket for the playoff game in October of 78. Gone to the, we'd gone to the final game of the year, a friend of mine and I, thinking that it might be Kari Stremski's last game. And we were big fans of Yaz. So we bought a ticket for the last game of the year and found ourselves in right field when the Red Sox uh, won and the Cleveland beat the Yankees uh, and we raced down and got tickets and I just watched for the first time in a long, long time the Bucky Dent home run this afternoon. It hurts every bit as much. <laughs> Saturday Night Fever was, had been the number one uh, movie in the country and the number one soundtrack for 24 weeks at that point. Disco was still alive. Most popular baby names were Michael and Jennifer. Steve Martin and Dan Aykroyd were wild and crazy. Um, and no male bedroom was without <laughs> Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> there were things coming, too, that we hadn't considered. And Apple II was one of them. Uh, something called Viskel was going to be the precursor to Excel. Uh, the Concord was making its maiden flights, uh, and Stephen Biko was going to be arrested in South Africa, triggering the fall of apartheid. Bruce Jenner was an Olympian and had net to meet a Kardashian. <laughs> OJ was a hero and would appear as a conehead on Saturday Night Live, 
this new show that was grabbing some attention. And it would be five years more before anyone thought of the Turk Duckin. <laughs> and on February 7, the actor Ashton Kusher was born. <laughs> yeah. January 78 had already seen quite a lot of snow. This uh, absolutely impacted my education. I usually say I can't do trigonometry because of all the snow. We missed too many days of school. There was snow everywhere prior to the blizzard. We, we had easily been out six days before uh, this storm hits in February, and then after that, we're out three weeks. Uh, so it, it definitely impacted how much learning was done. Um, there was a blizzard in the Midwest that had killed 51. So this was a, this was a winter certainly to remember. The tide, the height was listed to be 11.5 on February 7. It would be higher. <laughs> they would have that wrong. We saw a little of this in March when these numbers went crazy. Um, there were nine tides in March uh, that you know, we can drive around and we can see what damage was done. And I, God knows I picked up a lot of rocks. Uh, but nothing like this, nothing like the blizzard. The worst storm of the century. You know, there were 17 deaths in Massachusetts, record high tides, four feet of snow, in some cases even more than that, and wind gusts to 125 miles an hour. Here we are up in Surfside Road. This is a photograph shared with me by the Patriot Ledger writer, Dick Trust. He tells a great, told a great story of the blizzard. He had a, a house out there, a cottage, and he got up alongside the tide and he looked down and he saw the water begin to come into his house. And there was a glass on a coffee table and he watched the glass float away. Wow. And the next morning, when the tide had gone out, the glass was right by the back door, standing up. <laughs> it had floated right by. Went out with the tide, would have gone out with the tide had the door been open. Here we find ourselves in the harbor, the back side of the old Welsh company in the mill. We're up on the hill in Hummer Rock. From Minot to the harbor to Sand Hills to Town Way, there was destruction never seen before or since. You know, on the right, you see Sand Hills, the store, pretty much in the shape that it is today. There had been a fire, which you see in the middle of the frame. One of the neighbors told me that she, her dad was on the police force, or had just retired, and they called him in. And he moved them from their house and as the tide rose, and he took them to... Here, I guess his in-laws, his, his mother-in-law's house, because she had gas and they still had heat. And then when this fire took place and was connected to gas, he immediately brought them back to his house so they wouldn't be there, one of the Salvadors. Anybody know where? It's the mine and light in. We're in Hummerock, yeah, a whole new version of the two-door. Jericho Beach. A couple of photographs of the pier. Looking up the hill. Right? There's, there's your fireplace <laughs> on Oceanside Drive. Picture at the lighthouse. And he's not here tonight. I told him I was going to do this, though, so don't, I'm not talking behind his back. Tommy Galligan still hasn't been paid for that sink. <laughs> Never sent a bill for it. Here 
Here's one of the pictures that I'd, I had never seen before. This is taken at the height of the storm by Officer Rosemere. His wife um, shared this with us very late in the process, and I, uh, I guess two weekends ago, I brought them, I brought her a disc so that she had these image, images digitally herself. She had two books that were just amazing of photographs that she took, and some of these were taken by her husband the night of the storm. That's the same shot the next day. The old playhouse. That got water. That got water if there was a, a drop. Yeah, a regular day. My, my sister worked there at the time. My sister and my best friend both worked at the movie theater. And the girl that I took to the prom. And I'm officially old because my prom date is going to turn 57 Monday. That's, I think that's a sign. Here again is one of Officer Rosemere's down there at, in Cole Parkway. And then the next day. Take ourselves back to Jericho Road. And this home up in the glades, Jamie Constantine's home, uh, really did go all the way around the world. There were newspapers, um, the Associated Press sent this everywhere. And this became one of the telling images of the, of the storm. Here we are in the Egypt Beach area. And this first home that you see in several different pieces actually belongs to a friend of mine. He was the first one I thought of in March because Jerome always, had, his house fills up with water in a second. My sister-in-law's sister owns the second house now. And I wondered if she in March had any second thought. She left, she did not stay. Uh, and it's been elevated some more, but uh, she and Joel would have gotten a, an eyeful that night, all through those tides. This was an amazing photograph that I, very few people, if anybody, had ever seen before. This is the corner of Lighthouse Road. If you were heading the wrong way, heading down towards Dave Ball's house. You know, and I want to know, did the storm move that car up there or did he drive it up there? <laughs> right? You see that car in the middle of the frame? It was so hard to choose, there were so many, and I wanted to be representative. Dave Ball told a story in February of being called by the family that owned this house in late, late in the, late in the day of the 7th, and being asked by them to go down and pull the storm shutters. <laughs> Probably, probably an inadequate response. Oh, went too fast. Here you see us on Turner Road, a couple of different images. Oceanside on your left and Turner on your right. Up on Egypt Beach, there were a number of little cottages on Egypt Beach. And they were there and they were gone. An aerial shot that I had certainly had never seen before of the light and all the debris around it. We have some photographs of like really the day after on the ground at the lighthouse, but they're not of the best quality. They were taken by my next door neighbor who was Betty Foster's sister. And she you know, suffered with the same thing that my mother had, which was the inability to take a picture in focus. <laughs> We zoom up a little bit. You can see that the runway has been broken off. It's the only time in the 200 and now 207 year history of Situate Light that the runway connecting the cottage to the tower had been breached. All right. It was built in 1817 by the first keeper. We have a letter that indicates he asked for $177 to build a porch and he built the kitchen wing, the, the easternmost wing, 
and the connecting tunnel in 1817. So in 200 years, only this storm ever breached the tunnel. Now, I got some water in it, and there was a storm back in 2010 where I had to take landscape timbers and put them across because the rock was adding up against the, the runway so much. And it, the, the landscape timbers snapped like kindling in the middle of it. It was quite a sound to hear. Um, but this is the only storm that it was ever breached. And here's a shot looking back the other way. The tower at this point, if some of you may know this and some may not, that the tower was not lit at this point. It was only lit to landward with a blue light. And that's the boards that you see up in the, in the front. It was until 1994 that the society was able to relight it. I was up last night. In the March storms, we had the, the flagpole sheared off. That was a little bit of a surprise, Sunday night into Monday morning. When I went out on Monday morning, I thought, what on earth is that? I thought I got everything. Cleaning up from the day before, and the flagpole was down. So yesterday, the flagpole was restored. This is Mrs. Laidlaw reporting out. Um, at the lighthouse last fall, the tower had been repaired and painted, and the trim on the cottage had also been painted. And we were very proud of the lighthouse. But on February 6th, everything changed. Mrs. Gillis and family got out ahead of the high tide and all was all right then. The high tide and 90 mile an hour wind threw large rocks against the house and building which connects the cottage to the tower. It broke the walls of the connecting building and all that was left of it was the roof. Shingles were ripped off out of the building in the northeast side of the house. The historical descriptive sign was broken and we were very lucky because we didn't have any water damage in the house. I will tell you it's a pretty solid house. I think it would take quite a lot to get water in it. Um, all the water was shut off and Betty Foster did without water until April. I think the end of April they actually ran a hose across the parking lot. We had to do this a number a couple of years ago now I guess there was a stretch where it was never warmer than 27 degrees. I guess it was 2015 and we went 35 days with water only part of the day. It was frozen in the street it wasn't frozen in the house. The, the valve itself was broken and they couldn't get it repaired for a while so and we would run a hose to our neighbors that would freeze every night and only be it would thaw out for about four hours in the afternoon our neighbors were very good to us and Betty were very good to her um, we're now waiting for the okay for the funds to repair the connecting building um, and we'll have to replace electric current etc in all the storms, 1888, 1898, 1972, there's never been any real structural damage before. Only the blizzard of 78. I did have a storm on Christmas, day after Christmas, the Boxing Day blizzard, I call it, um, in 2010, that did shred a wall of some shingles. And there was a shed uh, that's been since rebuilt that did burst through, did break through that night. It was quite cold that night. Um, but other than those two events, the building has never been damaged. And here you have pictures that I didn't know existed until a short time ago. They put the shed back on and when we had it repaired in 2010, the contractor told me it was held on with six bent nails. <laughs> we, it's a little better now. All right. Now this happens to be someone that was related to Mr. Scott and he, he didn't really go to the movies. He wasn't really at the movies. <laughs> he was somewhere else. But he told people he was at the movies when his car was buried like this. This has always been my favorite. I can't tell you why, but the, the idea that in front of the church there wouldn't be any wake. <laughs> A friend of mine sent me a picture after I talked in February saying, I just found these. They were my mother. She lives in Pittsburgh now, my friend Joanne. And her mother had taken this picture too. And how, here we are back all around town. Where's that? I think that's, I think. I don't, want to over, I don't want to jump too fast, but I think it's Hummerock. Mm -hmm. 
That's Seventh Ave. That's in the marsh where they are working feverishly to try to put some stone to finally take this away. So assessing this damage must have just been impossible. Um, in one story, a house along Town Way, the homeowner, this was in the paper, the homeowner says, I could have pushed my whole house over with one hand. Right? And there were neighborhoods underwater for days. This happens to be in Hummerock. This is on Oceanside Drive. Long Turner Road. A little close up of, oh, I guess we're down further. Long uh, so Oceanside again. We're on Turner Road, right next to the, where the fire took place, opposite the store, just on the diagonal. Again, Turner Road. I was struck by how, as I, I looked through this, my question for Paul Scott was, how good was the electric company that he said they were unbelievable because the wires were everywhere, yeah. everywhere. You know, I had to walk out one time. I, uh, I have a, she's now 19, but she wasn't always. <laughs> and we, I was at the house and she and my wife had left. And then she became very upset that I was there alone. And so they got word. My sister walked in across the beach to tell me, your daughter needs to talk to you. And I walked out with just a handful of wires and I was a wreck. I can't imagine what this was like. And so everywhere you went, you were, you know, you were in trouble, but for these crews that came through. Now, what number did you tell me you were at? You are 68. Well, that was 54. Do you know where we are? That's the Yacht Club. All right, that's the Yacht Club parking lot. I think that since I've seen, I go by this of course every day, and some, you know, the sun, sunrise is cool enough, I'll pull in, and I think of this, this picture. This is a picture that we still need to research some more because Paul Scott did not remember this. This looks to be the mouth of the South River closed by a sandbar. And it's like there's nothing written down about it. At no point is this reported by anybody. But this was in these photographs and I saw it and I thought, wait a second. No, I didn't know this happened. And it's, it's, it seems to be one of these things that people let pass somehow. But this is the mouth of the South River closed by this storm. No photograph captured the effort of journalists quite like this one. This is by Kevin Cole. And he put himself up in a helicopter. And when you go to DC, my daughter's a student at American University in Washington and um, I'm adopting the museum. If you ever make your way to Washington, you must go to the museum. Well, this is given a pretty, pretty high profile, this photograph. It's given a kind of a special display where they have converted the photograph to a 3D image. Um, it's amazing. And the, all the journalists who were out to read their accounts of what they had to do to get film back and what they had to do to get things processed uh, just to get the paper out um, was astounding. The situate damage was seen at 54 million. It'd be the equivalent of 200 million today. <clears throat> Governor Dukakis came down, did a helicopter tour. Um, the Herald got a storm souvenir edition out. 
And here are the stats brought to you by my friend, Mr. Chesia. Uh, this was in, I believe, Yankee Magazine. Maybe some of you get that. Um, 33 hours snow fell, 92 mile an hour winds, 400 volunteers shoveled off the T tracks to keep the subway going, 3,500 motorists left on 128, 2,100 homes destroyed, five the crew lost on the pilot boat can do, trying to rescue a Coast Guard boat. 61 estimated percentage of destroyed homes that were on the South Shore. We've been taking punches for a long time. In Massachusetts, 339 homes were destroyed, 1,000 received major damage, 5,500 received minor damage, more than 135 businesses were destroyed. Eight 80.2 million have gone to the homeowners and 67 million to the businessmen. And you can see some of the other costs connected to it. For automobile losses alone, insurance companies paid 25 million. I guess that they didn't get that, car, that Ford out of the sand in Hummera. <laughs> Stories began of these terrifying hours and they came from every corner. Hi, welcome. The town was sealed off by the selectmen, right? shut it down, and only those with identification were allowed to travel through. Seen from the air, the snow begins where the mud ends. Beyond the South Shore coast, a rugged line of rubble devastation, there is isolation. Skipping down, those houses not ruined appeared sandblasted and pocked by sand. Just a few hundred yards inland, other houses are engulfed in drifts of snow. What might have been streets or driveways are just part of the expanse of white. That's how it looked from a helicopter flying 400 feet above the ground in a great circle from Boston to Situate to Randolph and back. There's a small pond behind Peggy Beach. In it floats the first floor of a house. No second floor, no roof. The nearest of a dozen foundations it might have belonged to is 250 yards away. A blue station wagon, only its roof showing, is sunk in a pond behind the beachfront. I don't know how it got there. Even in the summer, there's a marsh and there's no road anywhere near it. Situate Harbor is filled with chunks of ice like shards of a broken window pane. Boats are beached, overturned, or float like bobbers far out from shore. A 30-foot boat is nosed into the side of the Welsh Company lumber, yards, lumber Company's garden shed. The shed is at least 10 feet above the waterline and 100 feet from shore. On Oceanside Drive, sand was six feet deep. And this is probably my most vivid memory. It was standing next to the street sign on Marion Road with the sand up to the height of the street sign, my ankle next to the street sign. All the sand in Sand Hills was called away by the National Guard in the spring of 1978. Gil Patterson, only a, it's only a miracle that the sea didn't take hundreds of people from their homes. This is from a Mike Barnacle article. Manhill Beach sat under the cold glint of the high winter sun with the ocean licking at the rubble of the houses that used to stand high on the crest, but now disappeared into the marshes 500 feet away. Whose house is this? Danny McClellan was asking. Some priest, I think, Sean Harris. Our selectman, he was all of 14, he's doing his first interview, he's getting ready. <laughs> How many houses were there? Two or three, McClellan. Oh no, said Gerard Ryan, there were six houses up here. Not anymore. I went the wrong way, sorry. Here we go. I'm hitting the buttons too fast, hold on. So this is Stanton Lane. After the storm. And this is when it, the beginning is of the rebuild along Manhill Beach. And see those pilings in the front. Yeah. 
This is from the glades. First the walls blew off and floated right by us here down the driveway. Then the stoves from the apartments came floating through. The stoves were floating just like corks. They floated right out into the marsh. When I saw the road buckle and come apart right there, I said to myself, well, this is it. We're done for. But Billy Murphy and Franny Joyce came for us to take us out. I went out on the porch and the wind knocked me right on my ass. Ten feet back. This is, I think, Mr. Murphy. Then we went up to the glade, seeing if we could help people, get them out, you know? That was when? Tuesday? No. What day is this now? Thursday, he was told. Well, we took a lot of people out. The gas was splitting up into the air from the broken lines. You could smell it all over. The sum of it was nuclear, an entire area blown away in the grip of something no scientist, no genius, no human mind or authority can control. The storm came and went and never looked back for survivors. Story of Walter Barrows. Greenbush recounted a rescue he and a police officer made on Glades Road. It was two hours before high tide and we didn't think the water would be that rough. He drove a two and a half ton truck to a home at the end of Glades Road accompanied by a police officer. A few minutes later Barrows seeing 20 foot waves breaking over the truck also went to the house and led the children back to the truck as a huge wave knocked them beneath four foot deep icy water. The police officer, who I think we've determined to be Officer Ladrigan. Am I saying it right, Mike? How do you say Mike's last name? Ladrigan. I think we figured out after the fact in February that that's who it was. Um, had formed a chain with the youngsters, mother and father and grandmother, and was right behind the three when they were swept underwater. When I came up with the little girl was still holding onto my hand. One of the things that happened in February was that when I was done, a couple approached me. She had been one of the people saved in this story and never knew who did it. Ray Riddle, down at the, Thor uh, what we would call Thornton's in my youth. Um, he knew all about storm warnings, but instead of moving to higher ground, decided to wait it out. He thought he had seen it all before. And this story from the old um, South Shore News goes on to tell you how I'd seen this, this was no big deal. And they found themselves upstairs with his tenants deciding they would go two by two out so they wouldn't all be lost. And it finishes, I had a nice market here, but I don't know about the future of this area. It could turn around and be good, but we'd need tremendous federal help. Some told, people told me they'd be crazy to rebuild here, but you never know. And he sat there and he waited it out and he was fortunate enough to, to make it through it. Um, he had been asked to evacuate, had refused because he thought he had seen it all before. But nobody had seen the blizzard. Mm -hmm. Fishing industry took an amazing hit. They quote Mr. Fenton, Three boats came ashore, three others sank. You know, the, I know that the Kroll family took a big, big hit. They lost some boats in this storm. Um, they never really recovered from it. Steve Soans, my, my friend, um, tried to get his boat back in the water. Uh, I was mentioning Steve earlier today. It was Steve Soans who told me in 1991 that the no name was the only thing close to the blizzard. He lived on Damon's Point in the no-name storm. The tide never went out for three days. He said it was the only thing comparable to the blizzard in his experience. Uh, it was going to be his big year. Um, he was a good guy. These were the passes that you had to have. And this is Dave Ball's pass. Um, both Dave and Betty Foster tell the story of trying to return to their houses after evacuating and not being allowed to by the National Guard. Um, Betty had gone over to the harbor and then had gone to her shift at the hospital and came back and wanted to go to the house to see where it stood and a little one she said she must have been all of 16 and she had a rifle and she said you can't go down there she said well I'm gonna go down there I live down there and I'm gonna go see what it's like at the house you have to stop or I'll shoot you 
<laughs> she said, you are going to have to shoot me because <laughs> I'm going to go down and check on the house. Um, there was no shooting, but there were, there were threats. Dave said the same thing happened to him. There were looters. Um, there's a woman on Rebecca Road who very much remembers, you know, still gets a little scared by it, of arriving back to her house to find a whole bunch of people there hauling stuff out of her house. And them telling her, you don't want to be here right now. There was one guy, and I don't know if I put it in here or not, who, he was a, a merchant in the harbor. He said anyone that sh was caught looting should be hung. He was quoted in the paper saying that. Um, they sent a bus down to Hummer Rock, get a lot of kids out. That was one of the, uh, the many missions that were accomplished. Uh, I had no idea about this. How many of you remember Joe Green and the BZ Copter? Yeah. Joe Green was sent to pull Mrs. Jean Jones from Fourth Cliff um, because she was near delivery of her baby. <laughs> and I did not know this at all. They delivered the expectant mother to the high school instead of the hospital because her labor pains had subsided. And Chief Stewart shared that. Will Situate ever be the same? Because right away, I, I spoke to um, Mrs. Nellis about this. Her husband, Dave Nellis, had, uh, was the head of the Conservation Committee, and there was a big question right away about whether anyone would be allowed to rebuild. I mean, almost immediately there was this question of, should anybody be on Townway? Should anybody be on Surfside Road? And in the end, quite a number of homes were um, bought by the federal government on Townway, and after 91, there were even more. Governor Dukakis came down. Here you see him on Turner Road. We still have a long way to go. And suddenly, a lot of heavy machinery was on its way to Situate. These were pictures that Mrs. Rosemere had that I did not have. I was really grateful for them. Let the kids sit in the helicopter for a little bit. This is in the high school parking lot. Over on the side by the tennis courts. And this, we're really, again, kind of curious about. We, no one has a memory of it that, that we've been able to pin down. We asked uh, Anthony about this. And we, we're sure it's Hummer Rock, but was this a breach? Or were they just taking the sand off the, uh, off the streets and pushing it there? Um, but that's a pile of sand. They wish they had it now. All roads in the community were open. Many persons took advantage of the blue skies and mild temperature. This is, again, one of my most vivid memories of it. It's just how nice it was afterwards. And officials said road in the heavily damaged areas were cut off to traffic while military personnel and DPW crews began moving rubble. In a meeting at the high school, town officials decided to close the school for the next two weeks. And it was, ended up being three, in my memory, and a woman sitting at the lunch counter on Front Street. So I imagine this was at Curtis Farms. Can you believe this? Two more weeks with the kids at home? We're all half crazy now. <laughs> Nobody's got anything to do. What the hell is it going to be like after two weeks? <laughs> So the recreation program was able to open up a couple of gyms and give somebody a fighting chance. Parents of children who have been displaced from their regular schools are requested to call the principal of the school they normally attend. So they want to make sure everybody goes back to where they belong. They opened up a couple of hours a day. From Atlanta, some help arrives, and his name was Jack Nugent. He had quite a lot of experience in this type of um, process and they pulled him out of a dentist chair and one of the neat little details that comes out of this is that when he got here Carl Pipes finished the job <laughs> Dr. Pipes finished the dentistry <laughs> he 
And here they go. We're off mine it. This is up on uh, Surfside where the wall just fell to pieces. Seventeen separate projects involving seawall repair, new revetments and breakwaters. And it was a multi-phase program that just went on and on. Um, there were programs coming out in September of 78 to help homeowners impacted. A couple of different programs through the governor's office. Here you see them at work with the seawall up in the glades. Unfortunately, April brought this discovery. There had been two deaths on Cedar Point. Ed Hartz was one of them. A little girl named Amy was the other. Uh, they went into the waters uh, late in the morning, early in the morning, I should say, uh, when a rescue was attempted. They asked to be evacuated after having um, passed on it the first time. And we have, you know, room at the Laidlaw Center is in memory of Amy um, and our park as you drive onto the point is offered in memory of Ed Hart. Uh, in April, his body was discovered um, over by what would be the Mill Wharf today, the old Maxwell's Marine. It was an emotional toll. I didn't know anything about this. This was really fascinating to me and it turns out that a good friend of mine's mother was part of this. She was kind of drafted as an ad hoc uh, counselor and will go on to get her degree from Boston College uh, in the aftermath of the blizzard. This was a woman who had eight, eight kids. They figured if she could manage the eight of them, she could help out uh, with other people as they dealt with things. Um, and it was called, I'm losing the name of it, there's a name for it, Project Concern, that 416 cases in situ uh, were seen with a form, I guess we'd label it today, of post-traumatic shock. Mm -hmm. At least 11 of these Peggotty Beach homes were moved uh, or purchased by FEMA. And later on, there'll even be more of them. You've seen this. You know, this is an aerial shot of what's called a shingle beach. And Mr. Scott did a better job of discussing this, I think, than I will. Well, I'm going to try my best. But this beach was very much threatened. Um, in a storm in 1851, this beach failed. And there was actually a little mini harbor. I don't know how many of you have ever heard Bob Corbin talk about this, but Mr. Corbin is brilliant on this particular topic of how what we refer to as Muskoshkut Pond was actually a little harbor for a number of years until another storm filled it in again with this shingle beach. So it was in deep, deep trouble in the blizzard. And the thought was this water is going to go all the way to North Situate, certainly to Hollett Street. And it was trying. So, t former, you know, one of the original hosts of the Today Show, back in, in the day of the dinosaur, or at least the day of only three channels, uh, was Dave Garraway. And he had this unusual home, which is no longer there. And this, just to the right of it, was the beach that was about to fail. This was a picture that was offered us by Enid Cullinan, Enid Rosemere Cullinan. And you can see the water at the corner of Gannett and Border Street. That beach was going to fail, and that's what was going to happen all the time. It was going to be there every day. Um, there was good stretches in situate history where this was the case. There wasn't a road to, to mine it. The high school became home to over 600. Um, they were babies, they were senior citizens, and there was one phone <laughs> up there in the lobby by the auditorium. That was the only phone there was. Um, Faith Bowker got up in February and outdid us all. I told her she could do this second one. She was so good that night. Um, but Mrs. Bowker was a Red Cross volunteer and with Mrs. Sprague and others, um, they made this happen. And she was brilliant. She said, every time I needed something, somebody stu stood up and it arrived. We needed food, suddenly they were in the freezers at the different elementary schools bringing stuff over. We needed this, we needed that. The word got out and suddenly I had tractor trailers. You know, my friend Bob Thorndike, 
who is something of the custodian of the glades, told the story of Harvard's own Chet Stone, who suddenly arrived with a tractor trailer full of Harvard gear. And half the town was dressed in Harvard <laughs> for the rest of the year. And the Harvard president didn't know anything about it. And they said, aren't you so generous? He said, what has he done now? <laughs> and then, other, of course, other people had to get on board and be as generous. I think I still have a couple Harvard things at the house from Chetty. Countless gallons of coffee. There were pets. They had to take care of all the pets. It was an astounding effort. And National Guard was appreciative, as you'll see. They sought a lot of rental housing. They just a lot of basics, things like food and shelter and, and clothing were up for grabs. There's an article that indicates that after about three weeks, the group that was one of the groups that was providing clothes to the people that were displaced pulled out. You know, it's okay, you know, now what we do? You know? The caption on this photograph was scavenging for clean laundry in situate. <laughs> you know, this is down on Oceanside Drive. And the basics really were in doubt here for some. And these were some of the certificates that were shared by the National Guard crew with the, the team here in Situate that did so much. 1st Battalion, 104th Infantry. Situate Chapter, American Red Cross for outstanding achievement in ministering to the needs of the ever grateful officers and men of the 1st Battalion, 104th Infantry during the blizzard of 78. Mrs. Sprague, Allison Sprague shared this with us. We were very grateful for it. Well, I'm going to go back to that one for a second. There's a paragraph in here. Uh, it is a rare privilege which this unit had in serving those at Situate and having been given the support by those who are always there in times of need, the volunteers of the Red Cross. And here's a photograph of some of them. I don't know how many of you know Faith. This is Faith on the right. Yeah, yeah there you go. We salute you all. So Faith shared stories of the school department, other town departments offering anything. Freezers and walk-in coolers were emptied. Blankets came rolling in. Pets were addressed. And there's the story of Chetty. So everybody wore crimson. <laughs> Paul Scott, Anthony Antonello, and Hetty Field were recognized. Um, they couldn't be granted bonuses. They had to be given uh, comp time. <laughs> and they weren't really able to use very much of it. Uh, they worked almost every night for two months and every weekend for almost three months trying to get systems back online. I will say, I want to only want to go back because I just caught the name out of the corner of my eye. Um, Paul Scott made it a point to me to really remark on the work that Jerry DeWight did. He was on the Board of Selectmen at the time and he said, Jerry DeWight, Rose, who had her television stolen out of her house <laughs> while she was at work for the town, came home to find someone taking her TV out of her house. Oh, a friend of mine told me to come and take this. They didn't want it to get ruined. She said, really, what's that friend's name? As they carried her TV out of her house. Um, but she's Rose Zub, Jerry Dwight, and um, Dr. Pipes. She said, we're just amazing. He, Paul said this, we're just amazing. He especially in the first couple of, um, in the first throw of it, he especially picked out uh, Mr. Dwight. The scouts kicked in, doing their part. 
And we'll give the last word to the great Bill Sexton, because that's what we do around here. Situate's finest. Situ Situate made it back. Um, there were buyouts, there were code changes, there were uh, much, much better communication networks put in place. Um, we just got a lot better at the, after the blizzard, and I think our responses, particularly in this, this past winter, were so good um, in part. And they're working like crazy along Oceanside Drive to see to it that um, that part of town, which has always been so vulnerable, gets stronger. I got this in 2013, and I will tell you, it's, it has saved a lot of wear and tear. No matter what the mess has been, uh, we are not threatened. The old wall didn't have anything that weighed more than 300 pounds. And it would roll at night. You'd hear it. And I always described it as a snare drum. This wall, the biggest stone in it, weighs 20 tons. What was a snare drum is now a bass drum. <laughs> and it beats at night. You know what I mean. It rolled, right, all night long. New seawall would be built in the glades. It cost 800,000. I would tell you that the revetment at the lighthouse came in under 700,000. It is a tremendous investment of your dollars. It actually came in under budget. And we had, they even had a little mutiny in the middle of it by the guys that were building it when the contractors decided they could go short make themselves a little bit more. It was a three-week mutiny. And they still came in under budget and on time. There was another unforeseen consequence of the blizzard of 78. Right? And I had a stinker in the front row, so it better not be you guys, who blurted it out when we did this in February. So what do you think it was? All right. The nurses at South Shore Hospital said, look out. <laughs> and this article finishes up with, when you're stuck in an apartment for six days with your husband and no heat, well, you better believe you do something for warmth. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, she's the only famous person that was born in November of 78. I didn't recognize a single other name. <laughs> Catherine Heigl. There were other people who just didn't get it. And up in Essex County, this guy says, um, it wasn't a blizzard. <laughs> Technically, it was only a snowstorm. <laughs> um, our great storm qualifies in snow depth, but the temperature never went low enough. And so uh, John McNeil says it wasn't a blizzard. Um, the rest of us would tell him he's wrong. <laughs> Most took this attitude, however. This is from a, a gentleman in Quincy. He remembers also a continuing spirit of friendliness he had never known before. It was just great the way everybody wanted to do something for someone else. And this is the headline when the globe went back to print. Situate light unbowed. And that's how we did it. We made it through because we kept our heads up and we looked out for each other. And there's your blizzard of 78. So I thank you. Oops.